until God says it's over. Keep fighting till your victory is won. He can. Hey, everybody. Let's go. Let's go. Hey, AZ, shalom. Let's go. Come on, everybody. Let's go. Let's go this afternoon. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, everybody who's coming on. Good to see you all. Thanks, Carla, for sharing. I appreciate it. Carla, you know exactly what to do, don't you? You come in and you share. That's good. Come on, everybody. Welcome. Good afternoon. If you are in Eastern Standard Time, good morning. If you're elsewhere, bless you all and welcome to a noonday Bible study. Good to see everybody who's coming in. As you come in, if you do me a favor, if you would share this on your page. Um, I really want to deal with something today. It's going to be somewhat maybe a little controversial, but I believe it needs to be dealt with. Hey, Sharon, good to see you. Blessings to you. Thank you for coming on. Hey, Stockholm, thanks for sharing it and being on with us today. Pray that the word blesses you. I welcome everybody, everybody, everybody. Come on, let's get a few more people in here today. I know that I'm not your usual Monday afternoon host, but here I am. My man, Apostle Gabe, good to see you. Blessings to you too, man of God. Thank you so much for being on. Good to see you. Listen, um, while I'm here waiting for a few more people to come on, if you're on here and you see the name Apostle Gabriel Martinez come in as one of the instructors, you need to tune in. He's got a great word from the Lord that God has put in his spirit. And the thing I love about his ministry and his message is it is meat that is palatable, meaning you're going to learn something strong about God but you're gonna be able to digest it. You won't feel like it's something that's so far over your head. Even though the information is deep information, God has given him an anointing to break it down to a point where it's so tangible and palatable. So support him when he's on, he'll bless you. Hey Sharon, good to see you. Diane, good to see you, thanks for coming on. Um, well, I'm not usually on on Monday, at noon, I don't really know um, how many people usually come on. Um, I'm gonna stay for a few moments and do what I do. I'm gonna greet everybody who comes in and then we're gonna pray and I'm gonna share something out of the word of the Lord. Sheila, good to see you. Thank you for always supporting. Um, I'm glad Sharon agrees. Um, man of God, it's, you're, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Um, and, and I say that from my heart, a uh, powerful message that the Lord uses you to break forth for his people. So um, there's another one of my brothers coming in, Bishop David E. Jackson. Jackson, you all know, um, you all already know he's a preaching machine. He's a preaching machine. If you have not sat at his table you are missing something. You, you can gain some weight if you sit down at the table of these men of, of God and be blessed by their ministry. Um, blessings to you also, Bishop Jackson. Powerful word on yesterday on favor. I remember hearing someone say that favor is not fair, but I believe favor is fair. And if you don't have it, it's unfair for you. <laughs> but if you got favor, favor is so fair. It's one of the things that belongs to us. Such a great teaching on it yesterday. Listen, I want to get into this, this word. Um, th as I said, this word is going to be a little controversial, okay? But I believe it needs to be taught. And so, hey, you know, those of you who know me know that I'm not afraid to talk about something that might rub people the wrong way. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much now 
for the grace that you have given to us, extended to us by Calvary. Thank you so much for everything that Jesus paid for. We refuse to go another moment in our lives without embracing and accepting everything he purchased. Everything that salvation gave us, everything that we currently have access to, we now access it in Jesus' name. We access the grace that is necessary to accomplish the assignment that's on our lives. We access the anointing that destroys yokes. We access, yes, indeed, the favor that causes us to receive promotions that we may not be qualified for in the natural realm, but because of who you are in us and who we are to you, we experience favor. We access also what salvation gives us as it relates to our relationship with you as our father. Now, Father, we embrace you because you've embraced us. Thank you for making us a part of your family. Thank you for washing us in the blood of Jesus. And when you see us, you don't see us according to our carnal flesh, but you see us according to our spirit, man. You have made us sons. And beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but thank you, God, that you're revealing it to us by your spirit. So today, as the word of God comes forth, I pray that it would search us in the very places in which we need you so much. I pray, God, for faith that we might be open to hear what your spirit has to say to us. We give you praise and honor. In Jesus' name, it is settled. Amen. Amen. All right, let me stop my music so that you all can hear me. Today, um, as, as a matter of fact, it hasn't just happened today. For quite a while, God has been dealing with me about um, Absalom. And, um, you know, we all have a certain level of understanding. Uh, and the Bible gives us a, a full story about Absalom. And in the end, how most of us process the story of Absalom is it's a tragic story about a son who attacked his father. And because his father was the man that the grace of God was on, and the power of God and the kingship was on him, uh, we kind of look at Absalom as rebellious, and, and, and absolutely we see that. But I want to deal with some things that I think we may not really look at uh, in detail, because when we read the Bible, I think sometimes we read the Bible incorrectly. Uh, to a degree, I believe that we read the Bible not knowing that there are some things that are not explicitly written in the Bible. There are some things that we assume because we have, we have a concept of Scripture. But when we bring personality, when we bring our common thought process to the Bible, there are certain things that you read in the Bible that if you put yourself in position to play the part of the people who are being talked about by Scripture— you will gain or glean a more important revelation, okay? Also, I believe that when a person's name is written in the Bible, we assume something about them or we give them some level of celebrity status. So because their name is in the Bible, we make them special. And we don't think of them as regular, ordinary men and women who God chose to use, all right? And when you don't think of them as ordinary men and women, you will never read the Bible and assume that God could actually use you the same way that he does the people who we read about in the Bible. They are normal, ordinary, regular people who God chose, all right? So when we think of it in those terms and we look at David, there are high, high accolades attached to David. Um, first of all, we know that when God was ready to remove the carnal king, when he was ready to remove the king that the people had chosen, he selected David. Now, what was in incredibly uh, uh, alluring about this story for me and what pulled me into the story is that God selected David, but David's own father David's own father did not invite him to his own elevation. Every other son was given the opportunity to pass by the priest and possibly have the priest say, it's him. 
So in other words, what literally happened in, the, in David's childhood, his father did not see his potential. His father did not recognize that on David was enough anointing to be king. He didn't look at him as even eligible. So when he received the information that the man of God was going to come and God said, anoint somebody in here out of your sons to be the next king, his father, Jesse, looked at all of his sons and invited the ones that he thought might be chosen. Notice that he, he invited everybody but the one who God had chosen. Now, uh, of course, we read this story, and when we read this story, we take some type of revelation out of the story to make us feel uh, excited about how they didn't believe it was going to be me, but God made it me anyway. And that's wonderful to extract from the story. But if we put ourselves in the story, we have to tie something here very important. David's father, David's birth father, did not see his potential. And it's one thing for the priest to call you anointed. It's one thing for the church to acknowledge that you're anointed. But it's a completely different thing. When the person who birthed you, when the person who should see your potential, when the person who should embrace you, when the person who should be prophesying over you and should be pushing you forward, rather than doing those things, they see you as not having that level of potential. And while it may not look to everyone else like a rejection, but I want you to think about it in your mind. Here, David is known, he knows that something is going on at the house because that morning, everybody's getting dressed. They're putting on their best clothes. They're spraying on their best cologne and they're standing in the mirror practicing lines and they're standing with their shoulders square. And David's father says, hey boy, I need you to go out there and make sure those sheep are okay. Now, this may not be a problem for those of you who have never been rejected by somebody who should automatically embrace you. But if you read the story from the perspective of David is related to Jesse by blood, and this elevation service is really David's elevation service, but his father didn't see in him enough potential to even invite him to his own party. Mm -hmm. And so now we, we see David has something that's presented to him by the spirit man, some gifting that's come to him by the Holy Spirit. The father in heaven has said he's somebody, but his dad in the house has said nothing. When the Bible says that uh, Samuel asked Jesse, do you have another son? He says, yeah, I got one more, but he's keeping the sheep. As if he was not eligible to do anything other than the tedious task of walking behind sheep with a pooper scooper. When essence, in essence, he was the one who was, who was chosen by God to become king of all of Israel. So finally, David comes in and the Bible says that when, when Samuel sees him, Samuel says that the Lord says, this is the one. He puts the oil on him. Now, David is embraced by the heavenly father, but he has to grow up with the rejection of his earthly father. Let me just say this. I think very frequently we, we, we have pre we've been pressured. Let me say this, especially to the men of God, um, since I'm on BME. And I know I've got a lot of the women of God here too. But I believe we've been pressured to perform for our heavenly father. We've been pressured to uh, make it appear that all that matters, all that matters, all that I care about is my relationship with my heavenly father. And what happens is we have an incredible relationship with the church as our brothers and sisters in Christ. But our family, our children are in crisis during this time. 
Watch what happens. And if we don't, as men of God, begin to acknowledge that the anointing on my life is not meant to make the children in my life feel neglected or rejected, if we're not careful, what will happen is as generations pass, what happened to us as children, as sons, what we missed as sons, we are not able to give as fathers. And so because David didn't get maybe enough hugs or because David wasn't acknowledged at his own celebration, he wasn't even invited. Now David gets in position where David is a father. Mm. And as a father, David was a failure. David was a phenomenal king. When you read about it, before he even became king, you can read about his accolades. David killed a, a giant with a slingshot and a stone, or as I had heard somebody say, a rock and a rag. David killed a giant basically with his bare hands without using all the tools that everybody else around him had. He didn't have a sword. He didn't have a spear. He didn't have a shield. He wasn't dressed a certain way. But because he had a certain type of relationship with God by the spirit, he was able to do certain things in the spirit realm that brought him great accolades. But when we look at David's natural life, in his natural life, see, this is one of the things that, oh my God, I feel such an anointing right here. One of the things that is bothering me in Christianity is that we are boosting men to become great men of God. But we are putting them in a position where they have to choose between whether or not to be a great man of God and be a great man. And I do believe that because what we do in the body of Christ is done by the spirit, is done by the anointing, is done by a grace that's not our own. Sometime we rather do that because it's easier to do because it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by the spirit. However, when we come home, being at home, you can't just pray your way through fatherhood. Y'all ain't hearing me. You, you, you're not hearing me. You can't just pray your way through husband, being a good husband. And what happens is if the church does not focus on how to raise a, a boy to be a man, then all we have is a father at home who has to teach his son the value of sonship that then translates to making your sons also feel valuable. So now David is made to feel as though he doesn't have any value. It's my celebration and my dad didn't even think enough of me to invite me to come to my own party. He didn't think enough of me. He left me out here in this mud. I'm out here stinking. But see, the thing is this. When, when, when the grace of God is moving on your life and, and, and that grace of God promotes you beyond your natural sets of circumstances, if you're not careful, you will translate that to mean that the natural sets of circumstances don't matter. But the reality is they do. So now David grows up. And David gets married and David starts having children and he has one son by the name of Absalom. Absalom has gotten such a bad, bad uh, storyline. The church makes us hate Absalom, but let's just talk about what really went down. Uh, uh, let's talk about this from a, a broader perspective. Let's put ourselves in the shoes. The Bible says that a day came where Absalom's brother, who was also David's son, who the Bible says was David's favorite son. Oh, I need you to catch this. David grew up in a house where he saw his father have favorites. So now David is in a house where David has favorites. And the Bible says that, that, that this favorite son raped his sister, which was his half-sister, which also was Absalom's sister. And the Bible says that it angered Absalom that his father David did nothing about it. Now the Bible does say that David was hurt because of it. David grieved because of it, but David did nothing. Let me just put this right here if I can. We've got too many wounded spiritual and natural sons 
whose spiritual and natural fathers are hurt by what hurt the men who they're leading, but they do nothing to make them feel better. Oh my God. I dare say that there are spiritual sons who will watch this whether you are live or you will watch it in recording. And I'm going to tell you what goes on with us men. And, and, and ladies, y'all excuse us for a moment. I'm us. Uh, yes, Lord. Excuse us for a moment. But the Lord wants to break down some things and bring some deliverance to us men. See, here's one of the things that happens to us men. Men are made to believe that you can be hurt on the inside. You could be wounded on the inside. But it is an attack against your ego go if you let somebody know that you're hurt. So what happens is we walk around angry with one another. We walk around missing something. We walk around knowing that we wanted something from our father figures that we didn't get or worse, we got something that we did not want from our fathers or our father figures. And we walk around with this machismo that says, I'm okay. Well, maybe if David would have went to Absalom and said, son, I need you to know that what happened to your sister hurt me. It was wrong. But because spiritual fathers feel like it's a flaw to go to your son, my God, to go to your son because your son is beneath you, because your son is under you, and tell him, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I should not have handled you that way. Because we're not doing that, what we're doing now is we are perpetuating the issue of a son being wounded by his father. And let me say this, it doesn't matter how many times the woman hugs you, it doesn't matter how much sex she has with you, it doesn't matter how many kisses you get, it doesn't matter how many people holler your name when you're preaching, if you've been rejected by your father, there's no way to get past it without it being dealt with, because it gets no better. Let's look at the story. Let's look at the story. Now, Absalom is upset that his sister was raped, his father knew about it, and his father did nothing. See, maybe the problem here is that because David didn't really have a good relationship with his father, mm -hmm, now he doesn't know how to relate to his children. But because like us, like us in church, uh, we care more about what the people think about us when we have the crown on our head. See, David was also a king and he cared maybe a little more about what the people who ate from his table as a king thought about him than he did about those who ate from his table as a father. See, I just want to submit this to you men of God. You got to be very careful when people start celebrating you as a man of God and don't hear that the first word in man of God is man. When people start appreciating and applauding your oil that's on your life and not see the fact that up under this oil is a red blooded human being who hurts, who has issues, who has failures, who has weaknesses, who thinks certain things, who feels certain things, but they make you buy into the oil a certain way as if the oil's going to leave me if they know that I'm having an issue with how I deal with certain relationships. Listen, men, if we're going to lead the church to deliverance, we've got to be the first partakers of the fruit. Let me tell you this. I have been hurt before by men of God who were important and impactful to me. And what I noticed is this, the once, once you've been hurt by men of God who are important or impactful to you, if you don't deal with it, you'll repeat the pain. You may not do the same thing to the next person that was done to you, but you will repeat the cycle because there's something you didn't get. So therefore you're not able to give it to the next crew. And the way that we've got to deal with this is number one, if you have the opportunity, watch what happened with, with the, the relationship between David and Absalom. The Bible said that for three years, they never spoke. Here's issue number one. You cannot be offended 
and wait in your offense and lay in your offense and think about your offense and preach while you're offended and serve while you're offended. Let me tell you what happens when you're doing all of that. You're literally telling yourself that this is normal. It's not normal for you to be preaching with all that pain still inside you. That's not normal. That's what the church wants you to do because if you do that, it's some kind of proof of your oil. But I'm not here. I don't want to stand. I'm not going to stand before God and answer for the oil. Huh. I got to stand before God and answer for the vessel that contains the oil. What have I done? done in my flesh. So, so I refuse, watch this, because some of you all are in so much pain because of the neglect of your father figure, because of the neglect of the anointed person in your life, that you don't know how to be a father. You don't know how to be a father. You're the greatest preacher I've ever heard. You can hoop the paint off the walls. You know how to modulate to every key. And by the time you're finished, people are laying out on the floor. But when you go home, your wife and your children aren't even speaking to you. It's not because you're a bad person. It's because somewhere along the line, nobody told you what was really valuable. Mm -hmm. And because they make us feel like it's all, all they want is our oil. Let me tell you, this is, this is in your book. This is in your Bible. Your Bible says that there were 10 virgins. They were all virgins. I need you to get that. That means they were all clean. They had all been waiting. They were all focused on what, what, what the prize was or the goal was. But the Bible says five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Guess what the difference was between the wise and the foolish? The wise had extra oil. I need you to hear that. They were not, they, it was not how much education they had. It was not where they went to get that education. It was not whose church they were attending. What made them wise was they had extra oil. So you need to understand this. Some of you all have extra oil. Man, I'm going I'm to I'm preach this thing today. Listen, I know I only get a certain amount of time, but I'm going to preach this thing today and I'm going to tear down some walls because what I know is this. We have celebrated people who have extra oil. But if you listen, the people who are celebrating the ones who have extra oil are the ones who have run out of oil. The five wise had extra oil. The five foolish ran out of oil. So what did the five foolish ones say to the wise ones? Give me some of your oil. Not how'd you get the oil. Not I appreciate what you had to go through to get that oil. Not my God, I bet that oil cost you something. I bet you had to stay up all night fasting to get that. They never said one thing about how'd you get the oil. They were only concerned with can I get some of your oil. Listen, men of God, you've got to stop letting people bypass your experiences, bypass your scars, bypass your wounds because all they want is your oil oil. I refuse to let you discount what I've been through just because you want what's on my life. Here David is rejected as a son. Now he's got a son who needs him and he doesn't know how to reach out. Three years, no conversation. David was still king and hmm, David was still warrior. David was still going to the house of God. David was still writing Psalms, but somewhere he had a son who was growing increasingly angry with his father. Nowhere in the Bible do we read where David said, I'm going to take this crown off and go get my son. But we do read in the Bible where he danced till he, he was out of his clothes and his wife looked at him and said he looked like a fool. He looked like a fool praising God, but he looked like a deadbeat dad when it came time to his family. <sighs> Lord, help me to get this word out today because I know what has happened in the body of Christ. And this is the reason why we have men who either leave the church 
or who are quietly existing in the church in frustration because we've got too many people pulling on oil and not appreciating the vessel and not, not encouraging the vessel, not thinking about the vessel might be a human being going through something. When's the last time you just checked on your man of God? When's the last time you said, we're going to send the man of God and his kids on a father-children outing? Or we're going to send his family on vacation? When was the last time you did that? Or when was the last time you called them or him and because he didn't answer or call you back, you got frustrated, you got angry, you got mad? I've been calling because in your mind, the man of God belongs to you. So what has happened is we are perpetuating the problem where men can't be fathers. They can't be husbands. They can, but they can't be good at it. Because to be good at it, they can't give us 40 hours a day. They can't, they, you can't have, you can't be calling the man of God at three o'clock in the morning and don't think that that creates a problem for his family. But you don't think of him as a family man because we haven't made you all see us as men. Before I'm a man of God, I am a man. Before I could be your father figure, I have to be a father. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? I refuse to watch my children go to prison while keeping yours from going. I said it. I said it. I said it. I will say it again. I refuse. See, but what we don't, what, if we're not careful, they'll make you feel like because the oil is on you, because you're the man of God. You'll be just like David. David had a son who was growing more and more and more and more angry. And David never reached out. A prophet had to send a woman to David to cause David to feel in his heart, maybe I should reach out to my son. And the Bible says that Absalom, by this time, Absalom was livid. He was livid. David invited him back, but David still wouldn't let him come to his house. Three years. So finally, hmm, finally now Absalom turns from angry to rebellious. David could have saved him. David could have acknowledged him. I, I know, I get it. When we preach Absalom, we preach about his rebellion. We preach about how he died. But David could have saved him. While David was saving Israel, he lost his son. While David was making sure that the church knew how to worship, while David was writing scriptures in the Bible for you and for me, he lost his son. He lost his legacy that would have been handed to a son because his son needed an apology that he never got. Let me just say something to you. This is what I did. I was offended. I went to the person who offended me. I did exactly what the Bible says. I went to the person who offended me and I tried to work it out between me and them. It didn't happen. I did what the Bible said. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but I did what the Bible said and it never worked out. At some point, what the Holy Spirit told me to do, the Holy Spirit told me to go to that person and apologize to them for what you did to shed light on their weakness. I went to them. I did. I repented. I told them I was sorry. I shouldn't have done what I did. I walked out and I've never again went in that level or dimension because what I figured out is what the enemy was trying to do was poison me as a son. A poison son makes a poison father. That's how the enemy passes generational curses to us, you all. Let me just put this here for you to consider. Biblically, generational blessings come through the seed. That means they come through a man. Thank you, ladies, for all the prayer support that you've been giving us and for stepping up in realms and in ways that maybe we haven't been standing. But generational blessings come through the seed, which also means so does generational cursing. So what the enemy has done 
is he has allowed us right under our noses to watch sons who had no fathers become fathers who don't know how to father. Right under our noses, we've watched women who have had to raise sons and somehow make them men. How is it that we have asked our women to make men? The reason why we've asked is because a part of the generational curse that is now currently in operation in both the body of Christ and in the black community is there are no fathers who know how to father their sons. We know how to preach and boy, can we preach. But when it comes time to step away from that pulpit, Turn down. When, how many times have you turned down an engagement because you were going to spend some time with your son? Let me just tell you this. I never missed anything, my kid. If my kids were blowing a, a saxophone in the band, if they played a violin, if they were cheerleading at a game, if they played basketball, if they ran track, I was at every event they ever had. I never missed one event. Do you know why? Because the only way, other than prayer, that you can break a generational curse is you got to change the disciplines. You got to act in a different way than the crew before you acted. You're never going to be a blessing to your son treating your son the same way your dad treated you and if you're mad at your dad. My dad never did this. My dad never did this. My dad never did this. And if you are that same way, eventually your son is going to be the man saying, my dad never did this. My dad never did that. My dad never. If you're going to break the curse, brothers, first we got to acknowledge it. I've been a better preacher than I have been a father. You got to acknowledge it. You got to acknowledge it. I, I pastored somebody else's family better than I covered my own family. You got to acknowledge it. You got to acknowledge it. David never said a word. So eventually, David is attending the funeral of a very handsome son who is now rebellious. He could have saved him with an apology. He could have saved him. So I'm going just, to just take a moment. I'm going to just take a moment because this is what I believe. There is no profession, no profession in the business world or in the, in the spirit realm, like being a preacher. There's nothing like being a preacher. Many of us preach and go home and don't even know who we are. Conflicted on the inside. Let me just deal with this while I'm here. There are so many men of God who have been stripped in the natural sense. We take all their oil. We, we, we applaud their oil, we amen their oil, and we sow nothing back into them. And if they ask for something, we make them feel bad that they required something in return. I can't believe they asked for that much money. I can't believe they asked for that offering. Well, what you don't believe, what you also aren't seeing is that their kids need shoes too. And so what you will tell them is, hey, well, they need to get a job. Well, if they go get a job, then you don't get the access to them that you currently get either. You see how the one hand is washing the other hand? But what happens is these men have to continue performing as if they don't hurt, as if nothing bothers them. And what happens is like Absalom, eventually they become bitter. We preach bitter messages. You got, there's some preachers right now who are going through a bitter season. Everything they say out their mouth is bitter. And you're looking at them like, what's wrong with them? Maybe what's wrong with them is they're tired of being used. Maybe what's wrong with them is they have somebody in their life that hurt them and never came back and said, my bad. Shouldn't have done that to you. Right? Now, this is not a gripe session. This is for deliverance. So let me deal with this. Every man who's watching, especially those of you who are men of God, who've been men of God, for a while and who are connected to other men of God and you have served them in a capacity as son. Somehow, as their spiritual son, you've been wounded. You've been hurt. Um, 
there was there was maybe an opportunity when they could have elevated you or where they could have appreciated you publicly or where they could have said something to let you know how valuable you are to them and they did not. Or worse, they could have defended you, something that was being said about you, something that was untrue and they could have defended you and they did not. Or you're at a point where you're ready to quit church because something in you is now beginning to feel like you are a hypocrite because you are talking about a God who's able to do the things that you can't see him manifesting yet in your life. Or you're in an unfulfilled marriage and you're still trying to act like you're happy because you care more about what the church thinks about you than rather actually working on the marriage and getting the marriage on solid ground. So you won't ask for help because you don't want nobody to know that even a man of God has these kinds of problems. Before I let Absalom kill himself, I sit here as David, Hika Mosiah. Before I let Absalom become bitter, I sit here in the position as David and I declare unto my sons, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I left you feeling like this and dealing with what you're dealing with. And, and I know, I know, I know, I know, I know that through all these years, you've grown up to become something fantastic, but somewhere in you, you still needed what Jesus had when Jesus got baptized. The Bible says that when Jesus was baptized, after he came up out the water, a dove came down from heaven and a voice from heaven spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him, the, the part though of this is my beloved son, the, the being owned by your father. And I know that your mother loves you and the church celebrates you and applauds you, but maybe you don't have that father figure in your life that will let you know they are proud of you. I'm sitting today in the position of David and I'm saying, Absalom, please don't let this situation make you kill yourself. Please don't let this situation make you implode upon yourself. Absalom, please don't let this situation make you go back to cocaine. Absalom, please don't let this situation make you go back to being an alcoholic. Please, Absalom, don't let this thing make you pick back up all the secret things that you used to do when you do what you do because of pain. Don't let these things drive you back to that place. I refuse to watch Absalom die. I refuse. I refuse. Listen, we got to start going and recovering our Absaloms. We got to start going back. Those sons who are rebellious, but they're rebellious because of something that actually happened that was wrong or that was should never done or should have never been said. There are too many men in that position and they deserve the church's apology. They do. And if we don't reach out to our men to recover our men, God help us. But see, this is what I love about Jesus. I love about the word of God. The word says one of the things that's going to begin happening as the return of Jesus gets nigh is that he's going to raise prophets who will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children. Church, we got some work to do. We have become an incredible instrument for preachers. But we become a terrible place for fathers. Any man who can preach can get a promotion. We walk past good fathers every day, say nothing. You know why? Because we care more about oil than we do character. As long as that person can preach us happy, as long as that person can make us run, we don't care about the character. We don't care if things go well in their personal lives. So we pass it on to the next generation. David got rejected. David becomes a father who rejects. Let's break this curse. Let's break this generational curse. Brothers, Let's agree to break this generational curse. Let me just say this. The one way we will break this curse is we got to stop being in competition for pulpits. Stop trying to out-preach one another. 
all of us have our part of re revelation, right? We know, nobody's a better preacher than anybody else. You might have more experience in being able to deliver the message to the body of Christ, but that doesn't mean your revelation is any better. There might be some people who are still learning public speaking, still learning the mastery. Listen, I was taught some things. What I was taught was information, illustration, revelation, application, or I'm sorry, application, revelation is how you preach a message. But I was also taught how to, de to develop the message how to get it in my mind, in my spirit. So preaching is a art. It's a science. Are you hearing that part? But if you don't have any word, if you don't have any oil, if you don't have any anointing, I don't care about your science. You still got to have the anointing. So let's just get past the competition, brothers. And let's now get to a place where what we're saying is I refuse to let any one of my sons get into a place where they become bitter with me because I didn't father them the way I should have. I refuse to watch my son Absalom kill himself because he's bitter with me. I refuse to preach a better message in the pulpit than I do around my dining room table. This is what we got to do, brothers. If we're going to take the church back over, we got to take our houses. Mama, thank you for being mama. Thank you for being everything that you've been. But now I need you to SOS. I need you to scoot over some. I need you to scoot over some and make some room for me to be the father that I'm supposed to be and the man that I'm supposed to be. And don't look over my shoulder and judge me for what I don't know yet. I'm still learning. I did not see an example. I didn't know how to do this. I had a bad father. That's what's going on. A lot of our brothers had bad father figures, just like David. We don't talk about it, though. We don't talk about the fact that how did it really feel for David not to be invited to his elevation? How did that really feel? There are so many men who are dealing with real issues, but they're doing it under some level of anointing and preaching. There are men who believe that when something uh, goes on in their life that, it, that brings them to a certain place of emotion, they say, oh, I'm going to preach this week. Ooh, I can't wait to preach. Because they think that that thing gave them more oil for preaching. And they never think about, no, I need to deal with this thing. Okay? Look. I don't, know where, I don't know where the Lord is going to take us from this point, but what I do know is this. We can't keep losing our Absaloms and then blaming Absalom after he's dead. If he'd have listened to me, if he'd, we can't keep losing our Absaloms. What about Absalom? Who is going to say, today I'm going to take my crown off my head and I'm going to be his dad and I'm going to go work this thing out. That's when real deliverance will happen in our families and our church. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the kings who will hear and who are currently hearing this message. And Lord, you know how we are made. You built us. You know it's not just so easy for us to admit that we've done somebody wrong. And it's even harder to go to them and apologize but today, because we want to recapture the credibility of our anointing for our families, we want to recapture the place that you put us in in the garden where you did not give Adam a church. You gave Adam a family. And I pray now, Father, in Jesus' name, that you will cause the hearts of the fathers to be turned back to their children and the hearts of the children to be turned to their fathers. And that there be no more anger that causes bitterness that leads to death. But now in Jesus' name, we lay hold on our legacy. We lay hold on our sons. We lay hold on our daughters. And they will not be destroyed because of the lack of a communication and relationship between us and them. But in Jesus' name, we declare and we decree now 
that you begin to repair the breaches, the broken places in our lives. Repair. Father, some of us still don't know how to communicate with our children. We don't know how to talk to them. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to interact with them. Because we've been in relationships where the mother did most of the talking, where our wives did most of the interacting, and we were just the silent money provider. But I pray now in Jesus' name that we would understand the impact that our voices have on our sons and that we would identify them. We would, just like Jesus was identified by his father, we begin to identify them. You are good at what you do. You are great at being who you are, but beyond that, you are my son, and in you, I am well pleased. Father, I thank you that you cause us as men to walk in that security from this day forward. We give you honor and praise. In Jesus' name, it is settled. Amen and amen. All right, those of you who follow me, you know what I'm getting ready to do. I'm going to ask you to send me an email. I'm going to ask you to put the name the age <coughs> and the issue that you want us to pray for concerning the men in your life, whoever the man is in your life, we want to pray. And when I tell you we're going to pray, I'm not just saying it. I'm literally letting you know that I'm praying over the men in your life. I'm praying. I'm calling their names out uh, in, the, in the realm of the spirit while I'm praying. And I'm asking God to help those men recover all. One of the things I think the enemy is stealing from most men is what manhood looks like. He doesn't even want you to know what it looks like. He, when you ask a man for who's his example, he went to think a long time. And there are so many men who say God is their example. Think about that. God is their example. And the reason why God is their example is because they got to look around for a long time to find somebody. But when you think about Timothy and Paul, how Paul became Timothy's father, how he had no problem instructing Timothy, no problem handing to Timothy what had been given to him by struggle, or by suffering. That's how the legacy is supposed to work. Once I fight to get it, I give it to you for free. That's how the legacy works. But what we say is I had to fight, you're going to have to fight. Well, what was the purpose of your fight if you got to hand me the fight? Hand me the victory. That's how the father did it. Jesus handed us the victory. He didn't hand us the fight. He handed us the victory. Look, I got to go. But send those emails to Apostle Richard uh, Youngblood at, <coughs> excuse me, blackwomenempowered.org. That's Apostle Richard Youngblood at blackwomenempowered.org. And let us help you join in prayer and pray for the men in your lives. All right, I got to go. I love everybody. I want to take a special uh, moment here and mention Dr. Underwood. Yesterday, I got a chance to um, catch one of his broadcasts and uh, hear his ministry and uh, listen to uh, his praise and worship team and that sort of thing. And I just really enjoy the word coming from him. So I want to shout him out today. Uh, I also want to shout out Dr. King, um, let me let me just let me tell you all something. Um, this platform is so important. I hope you all see it even today. The value of this platform, the value of being able to tune in. Let me let me let me go a little deeper. My honorarium. Now, you you all may not really understand this, and it may not compute in your mind a certain way. But my honor, I, I receive an honorarium for ministry, okay? Um, and my honorarium is, it's modest comparatively, but it's high. I'm just, I'm just being honest. Um, I do this for free. So, so let me just make sure that it clicks in your mind. Without this platform, Without there being a black man empowered and a black woman empowered, you might not be able to get this word because this word is attached to an honorarium. Let that sink in for a moment. So I come to this platform for free. Now, I say that because every person who comes on this platform is bringing their 
uh, their, their, their education, their experience, their information, insight, and knowledge to you for free. I, I want that to sink in. That's why this platform will come under attack. The enemy does not want you to get this level of insight and information. Some of you all got healed today. Yes, you did. You got healed in this word today. It made some things that weren't making sense make sense for you today. And you got it for free on your phone. Okay? So I really want you all to understand that this is a very important platform. Pray for it. Pray for the people who come on. Pray for the people who lead it. Pray behind the scenes. Pray for everybody. Everything that has to happen for this to happen for you. Pray. Because it's a blessing to be able to just tap into Facebook and get this word. There are others who are doing phenomenal teachings. I see Minister Long on. Phenomenal word. I see Prophetess Diane who is on. I see Toya uh, who's on. These are people who do incredible jobs bringing us word, bringing us direction. When you come on, don't, don't, don't take it for granted. These people could be somewhere receiving uh, an honorarium for what they're doing, but the Holy Ghost lets us have this platform to do it free of charge. It's a blessing. It's a blessing, but don't think it doesn't come under attack. The enemy does not want BWE and BME to continue. So he's sowing things and throwing things against it. But even now in the name of Jesus and by the power of his blood, I declare and I decree that the enemy's hand is broken on today. Now you watch how much you'll see how much man of God you all are entertaining when today God reveals the hand of your enemy. Lord, I thank you for it. I give you praise. I got to go. I love you all. You are valuable to the kingdom. Without you, I'm nothing. Keep persevering. Whatever you do, don't you dare quit. God is going to make sure you get the victory. I'll talk to you all soon. Take care of yourselves. All right. Bye.